So I'm going to try and squeeze in um, a good bit of information into a short period of time because I don't know about you, but I start to get hangry around lunchtime, um, so I do need my food. Um, just to, to clarify, and it's kind of probably a typo on my part, um, I am the proprietor of Three Steps now, but I don't have a role in the kind of day-to-day -day running. We fortunately have a new CEO in Three Steps, who's Patrick Tomlinson, who is here with me today, um, who has um, been working with us for almost the last year now in changing our kind of model of care and how we support the children within our service. Um, and what I do do now is a lot of independent work, um, completing independent assessments with Guardian at um, and that's how I know some of the people here because I get dragged in on cases to do some assessment work and, and, and look at kind of clinical formulations in the broader sense. So before I get started, one of the things I would like you to kind of keep in mind throughout um, my, my slides is to look at things at two levels. The micro level, as in what you can do from a case management point of view in the cases that you deal with, but also then to tap into the, the, the speakers this morning and look at things from a macro level as to what we can all do as a collective person. Because one of the things I enjoyed about sitting in and, and hearing the, the, the uh, speakers this morning is there's a lot of congruence in what I'm going to say, and I'm sure with the speakers this afternoon as well, and that's quite good that we're all beginning to sing from the same hymn sheet. Um, so I'm going to try and look at things a little bit differently um, and I'll probably come at things from a little bit of a different perspective just to maybe challenge the way we look at things or how we think about things. So bear with me and hopefully it'll all come together in the end. So. Um, this is a slide that I've kind of um, adapted from a, a professor of psychology in London, Professor Eamon McCurry. Um, he is based in UCL, so if any of you are fortunate enough to go to any of the big talks in London, you'll have come across Eamon's work. Um, I suppose he has done a lot of the, the um, neuro research, and there's quite a limited uh, amount of research in the population that we deal with. So sometimes we hear a lot of empirical information in relation to the long-term effects of neglect and maltreatment, but in relation to the effects on the brain, we're currently only talking about six to seven studies internationally, so just to put it in perspective, where they've gone and done functional MRI or MRI studies into the regions of the brain that are affected by maltreatment and neglect. But as you can see from this slide, um, the environment plays a big role, and I'm going to talk about the environment um, and how epigenetics is a factor within the environment role. But also I'm going to talk about if intervention is not uh, um, offered, how mental health difficulties can become quite entrenched quite early on. Um, attachment difficulties and then um, uh, are often to the fore, and we're all kind of familiar with that. But also, if we don't intervene, we are looking at kind of overall economic productivity coming down uh, in, in the population that we work with. But also, what I mean from that is low self-esteem and no self-worth. And so it's that kind of vicious cycle that can then lead to further mental health problems. So I'm going to try and encompass all of this in, in, and, and bring it all together towards the end. Quite a few of us, are, sorry, the, the speakers earlier this morning have put up definitions of neglect as well. Um, I want to just come at it a little bit differently in the sense of neglect is quite a wide encompassing term. And I think over the years, um, we've added other aspects of neglect or you know, divided it up into different forms of abuse. But I suppose its primary piece is a failure to meet a child's basic needs. Um, and then I want to refer you all to what we, the framework we have to work under, which is Children's First. Um, which is quite interesting because in some of the assessment stuff that I've done and some of the court stuff that I've done, I don't know what guardians feel or social workers feel, but with um, solicitors and judges in particular, I'm often pressed to give a yes or no answer or give a very kind of short, succinct, clear answer. And I don't know what your experience of psychologists are like, but we do like to talk <laughs> and we don't like to give yes or no answers. We like to give a more kind of rounded, holistic and pluralistic formulation as to what might be going on. 
So it's very, very difficult sometimes when you are put under pressure and you have somebody saying, just give me a yes or no answer, and you're going, no, I can't, because there's a lot more factors uh, uh, um, involved. So I suppose what I'm trying to say is when I'm talking about neglect, we have to be mindful that we're also talking possibly about emotional abuse. But also neglect is probably the baseline starting point. And when you have neglect, you often then have other forms of abuse uh, um, in that kind of developmental trajectory as time goes by. Previous speakers um, have spoken about willful neglect and circumstantial neglect. And this is a big difficulty because sometimes these forms of neglect continue on even after a child is received into care. And what I mean by that is people not turning up to appointments or not taking a phone call or not being there for access. And all of this kind of stuff can lead to very, very strong emotional responses in the young person that can really impact their brain development. And it's something that we do have to be mindful of. So it's not just about getting them into care and that's it and it's sorted. It's about looking at the long-term trajectory and, and consequences of that. And to determine that, unfortunately, you often have to look at doing a parenting capacity assessment. And this was touched on in, in this morning's uh, discussions as well, because you need to know what you're dealing with. Did the person have capacity to realise the consequences of what they were doing or not? So in relation to the intergenerational neglect, some of the things we have to watch out for are the patterns of difficulties. And they vary from family to family and from area to area. So urban difficulties can be quite difficult, uh, different to rural difficulties. If there are some genetic factors there, like dyslexia, specific learning difficulty or whatever, these are genetic loaded things that can also be, uh, need to be factored in. Our expectations from a society point of view or our judgments when we're making uh, assessments. Obviously, poverty has uh, been touched on before and low socioeconomic status is, is a factor. And if you have intergenerational um, neglect and you're having, let's say, impairments compounded by another generation of neglect, what you often find is the socioeconomic status is just getting worse because they don't have the resources within them to even work through the system and what supports and resources might be available for them, they don't tap into. And you can often get frustrated going, why didn't you do something? And they just don't know. And it's like rabbits in the headlights and they don't know what to do or how to go about getting it. Education um, is another significant factor because over time, and I'm sure you've seen it in some families where education just doesn't become a priority because the parents didn't achieve uh, uh, good schooling. So it's again, the compounding nature of the whole kind of piece. Multidisciplinary um, and interagency collaboration. And I think this is one of the biggest difficulties when it comes to trying to meet the challenges of neglect is trying to get many different agencies and many different systems to work in congruence and effectively. Because if we know that there's mental health issues, then we need to be communicating with CAMS and adult mental health services in relation to the parents' needs. And you can't tackle intergenerational neglect and the consequences of it if you just focus on the child and you don't focus on all the systemic issues that are going on. And the reason why the environment and the systemic issues are really, really important is because of the whole factor of epigenetics. And I'll get into that in a little bit more detail in a while. So if we look at, <coughs> excuse me, um, at the UK in relation to some of the research that they published, they said that babies under one year are statistically more at risk of dying from neglect. That's true, because it's a statistic based on research, but the reason why is because babies don't have the resources to try and fight for a survival point of view. They can't run away, they can't hide, they don't have the cognitive or physical abilities to try and live and survive from an instinct point of view, because that's an eight in all of us. The next kind of few slides I'm going to quickly fly through, because it's just to give you the 
developmental kind of trajectory that may be going on, but you can quite easily glean all of this if by going on the uh, NSPCC website and looking at any other kind of research in relation to this. But one of the things from a neurocognitive point of view is um, that there are a lot of neurocognitive difficulties that evolve over time. And the one thing I would like you to take home, the take home message of these three slides is, early intervention is key. We always hear early intervention, we hear it over and over again, but it is actually in the doing of early intervention. It's a lot easier to resolve some of the issues to do with neglect from a neuropsychological perspective if you're working with the kid uh, uh, quite early on. Plus, a change in environment, as you'll see when I get into the whole epigenetic factors, can be a massive improvement in somebody's life. So we can do a lot, but we have to get in there sooner. Because as the neural pathways are laid down as we get older and, 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 and evolve, it is a lot more difficult to then address behaviours that become somewhat entrenched. And then in adolescence, you often get to see similar behaviours and say, oh, they're awfully like their mother or that's their father. And it is because those neural pathways have become entrenched and they do become like their mum or their dad but it's not because of just pure personality it's because of neurocognitive difficulties environment how they respond to the environment and react to things <coughs> so the long-term effects are the person taking it out on themselves and the first two can often be covered under the whole mental health kind of issues, person taking it out on others. Uh, substance uh, misuse, eating and sleeping disorders. And that's quite important um, to look at if we're looking at a neurodevelopmental tra trajectory because when I get into some of the neurochemical stuff, one thing that's really important, and we all know it because we all sing it sometimes, kids need routine and consistency. And if they don't get that over time, all of their natural biological rhythms go out of kilter and they end up then becoming disordered, as we like to put it, and put all the labels and, and, and the, the, the um, syndromes and disorders on it. But it is an evolving process. And it's about getting the basics, getting homeostatus right, where the child is sleeping well and eating well. And then you're beginning to maximise how their system may respond and develop. So we know that it can then lead to criminality and violence. That was covered this morning. Antisocial behaviours. And we all know the trajectory from a diagnostic point of view where you start hearing the label uh, ODD, Oppositional Defined Disorder. And then when they're about 12, it moves on. And then when they're about 18, it moves on again. And then they get slapped with the antisocial personality disorder. Um, and again, going back to the previous speakers, we know all of this because all you have to do is take a family history and you can see, you can predict the evolution. You can actually predict it. You don't, sometimes you can just close your eyes and just write it out. Um, they then have problems with intimacy and separation. This is actually quite an important one in relation to the long-term consequences. Because if you have problems with intimacy and separation, you're going to have neurochemical problems in your body, which is going to impact you. So your oxytocin levels are always going to be not right, and you're going to struggle with it. Your serotonin, your dopamine levels, which are going to lead to mental health problems, poor self-esteem, all of those kind of issues. And that will then be the rest of your life. So it'll be failed, multiple failed relationships, unable to really trust somebody. And then, unfortunately, a, a very negative consequence is suicide. So this was supposed to play a particular uh, um, thing. You can actually find this online. If you just put in these three neurochemicals and cartoon, it'll lead you to a little, it's only like about 30 seconds long, but it shows you the consequence of different levels at a very basic level. It's just to give people an idea. So if you have low dopamine levels and high serotonin levels and low oxytocin levels, um, it leads to happiness. You will feel happy. 
That's the primary kind of piece. If you've high in all three, you'll feel love. Yeah? And if you think about the intimacy separation piece that I was talking about, if you've higher dopamine compared to low serotonin and low oxytocin, you'll have anxiety. And we all know that that anxiety then has a very clear clinical trajectory in the sense that you will start to feel anxious and then that can eventually lead to OCD type behaviors and generalized anxiety disorder. And then it starts affecting your daily function and how you function within society. And if you've got low dopamine, lower serotonin and almost non-existent oxytocin, it equals depression. But this is all at a basic level, just for, for uh, illustration purposes. So from a neuro perspective, one thing to keep in mind is um, often when people are looking at neurodevelopmental assessments, the focus is from birth onwards. If you're actually going to do a more thorough, robust neurocognitive and neurodevelopmental assessment, you'll actually start from conception. Because fetal development is really, really important in relation to how your brain develops. And teratogen exposure, I feel, uh, is, is under-recognized in Ireland. And what I mean by that is things like fetal alcohol and fetal drug syndrome and the consequences of that. And it's all on a spectrum. And it's how the mum metabolizes those teratogens as to how the, the outcome and the consequences of those are going to be. So yes, somebody might have a glass of wine a week or a day or whatever, and there might be no noticeable consequences to that. But then it could also lead to a very defined diagnosis of fetal alcohol syndrome, all depending on how that person metabolizes. So from three weeks onwards, so 21 days, into a pregnancy, brain development starts and moves quite quickly. So sometimes some mums don't even know that they're pregnant for, for a while and may have exposed themselves to teratogens. And it's really important that we factor all of those in in relation to the things because some of the neuro behavioral phenotypes that are associated with teratogen exposure are very similar to those that are associated with neglect. And retrospectively, it's very hard to determine what's what. <clears throat> so the pertinent points in relation to postnatal brain development are all got to do with the synapses. So our brain is just quite a floppy organ for quite a while. And what really helps from a synaptic point of view, and that's where neurons kind of join to lay down neural pathways that give us certain kind of characteristics or behaviors or allow us, you know, infants to clap or smile. These are all laying down of neural pathways. And they're in the beginning, and I'll get into it in a little bit more detail when I talk about the triune brain. Um, but in the beginning, they're just to deal with primary functions like our heart rate, breathing, eating and sleeping. And they're the kind of nurturance things that babies need. And as we go on and as we interact with a caregiver, those synapses become quite pronounced. And that's where attachment plays a huge, huge role in relation to how those synapses evolve, develop and are laid down. The other thing is this whole area of plasticity has become really, really um, pronounced from a research point of view. And we do know that the brain can adapt to the environment and can uh, compensate in so many different ways. So that gives us a lot of positive opportunities that if we intervene from an early uh, perspective, we can achieve a lot of positive outcomes for people. And then you've got developmental windows where you get these big spurts of development and growth, which are really, really important. And the more developmental windows you miss out and neglect influences or effects, the poorer the outcome for the person. So just to talk about epigenetics, um, it is got to do with alterations to the genes that do not include alterations to the structure of the DNA of the gene, but it can influence and determine how the gene is expressed. So environment 
and how we experience things can actually affect how our genes are expressed. Yeah. And this is really, really positive and it's really, really uh, exciting because it's a huge new area of research that's taken off, particularly in North America, if Trump doesn't stop the funding for it. <laughs> but um, also in Australia and, and, and uh, a lot of other countries, um, Scandinavia in particular as well, about how the environment can play a role. And what we're actually finding now is that all of this new epigenetic research is supporting some of the models that are already out there, like the social pedagogy model of the hand, heart and head kind of piece and linking in with the environment and how important the environment is and so how social pedagogy may kind of have more of an attachment focus to it and what that means. It also shows that with routine, structure and consistency and repetition, you can actually teach skills and also improve somebody's trajectory. So I put this up to say that, um, if just as a reminder to myself, so if you ask me any questions after, and I don't know the answers to it, I'll just say it's epigenetics. Can everybody read that? Um, if they ask you anything you don't know, just say it's due to epi epigenetics. So now when you go back to your office, or if you're in supervision, somebody asks you something, oh no, it's got something to do with epigenetics, I don't know. <laughs> But going back to that evolving neurodevelopment, um, I want to talk about the triune brain because it's quite important. We have, I suppose, from an uh, uh, illustration perspective, we have three brains within what we often refer to our brain, which is within our skull. So we have the central core, which is often referred to as the old brain or the reptilian brain, um, which you can see on the far left. So that's got to do with the cerebellum and the, the brain stem, and that's responsible for kind of our, our primary movements and our heart rate, sleeping, breathing, all of those kind of basic functions. And it's perceived that that's what is actually kind of working when you're born in, in a newborn infant. And then we also have the limbic system, which is the, the middle one here. And if you can see, there's an extension out into the cerebral cortex. But if you just look at the limbic system, it is responsible for a, a number of things, but its primary piece has got to do with emotion. And that's why babies' main communication at the beginning is crying. And they have different cries for different things like nappy change or hungry or frightened or whatever. And that's the limbic system beginning to evolve. Uh, as time goes on. And then we have the cerebral cortex, which is responsible for a lot of our, our, what makes us kind of human, so our computational skills, language, all of those kind of areas. And if somebody's going through a cognitive assessment or a neurocognitive assessment, the main area that is being assessed is the cerebral cortex, the, the, the neocortex is often called as well, or the new brain. So, if you look at it, it, it's kind of broken down here. So the, the new brain as the cerebral cortex is often referred to as the human brain. And it's got to do with language and ideas. And as I mentioned before, the limbic system has got to do with feelings and emotions, but it's also got to do with memory. And I'll get into that in a little bit more detail shortly. That's quite important because the limbic system is five to, is considered to be five times stronger than any other part of the brain for purely from a survival point of view. So it can basically kick in and override other parts of the brain. So we might be able to cognitively and consciously tell ourselves that we may, may be able to tackle a raider that's coming into the house. But if the limbic system is getting too uh, hot up and worried, it can override and say, no, do you know what you're gonna do? You're gonna run. Are you going to fight? Are you going to do whatever it is to, 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 to kick in? And it's all got to do with survival. But if you recall, I spoke, it's got to do with emotion and memory. And it's the limbic system that often becomes impaired when you're dealing with traumas. And that's where the most of, um, most of the effective intervention piece can, can really uh, work. Then we have the reptilian brain, and it's referred to on this slide as instinct, dominance, and survival. And that's right to a certain extent, but 
we now know that some of the things that were considered to be innate, like a baby kind of smiling back at you in that reciprocal way, and the whole clapping of hands and you clapping back and the gooing and the gang and all that kind of stuff, we always consider that to be innate, but it's not. It's actually procedural and we start to learn it. So the more repetition you do with those kind of things, the better the neural pathways and the more fluid you become at that. So now you're beginning to see the importance of attachment because it's down to mum or dad or whoever the attachment figure being present to give you those opportunities in order to enhance your neural development. So I've just, that slide, I'm going to kind of skip in interest of time, um, but it, it, it's there for, for you to reference down the line. So going back to the limbic system, um, it is considered to be five times stronger than any other part of the brain. So how it responds to things in the environment is really important. And if it becomes hurt or damaged because of experiences, or if experiences don't allow it to become more robust and be able to adapt to many different aspects of the environment, it can then affect how the neocortex, which is the new part of the brain, then goes on and develops from there. And that's why we often talk about emotional dysregulation and somebody having problems in managing their emotions. And that is a primary difficulty associated with neglect because children don't have the resources or a large repertoire of dealing with different situations because they haven't had the experiences in, through interactions. If you look here, we have, I can go over with the microphone and everything, but um, the two main areas I want to focus on just now are the amygdala and the hippocampus, which from an er but ergonomic point of view makes sense because they're right beside one another. And at a basic level, the hippocampus is considered to be responsible for memory or the acquisition of memory. And the amygdala is seen as the kind of primary emotional response. And so that's quite good because if we get a lot of experiences, we lay down a lot of memories and we get to deal with different scenarios and different situations from an emotional point of view. And in time, if we've got a regulated caregiver or attachment figure, we will become quite regulated and resilient in how we interact with our environment. However, if our experience of our primary caregiver is somebody who's quite emotionally dysregulated themselves because of neglect or trauma in their past or mental health difficulties, then that's our pitch in relation to how we're going to start responding to different aspects of our environment. So how our primary caregiver or attachment figure responds to the environment does influence how we then evolve and respond to our own environments too. If the amygdala is being hurt, for the want of a better description, by traumas that are being presented many, many times by the hippocampus, so these horrible memories or recalls or whatever, it can make our amygdala a lot more sensitive and very reactive to certain things, or it can actually shut it down where we just don't become reactive at all, and we become quite flat and non-responsive in lots of situations. And if it really is fried, we become quite dissociative. But if you go, and, and sorry, if you look at the, 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 the diagram again, one of the things that is part of the limbic system is the hypothalamus. So the amygdala and the hippocampus, the hippocampus giving you memory, and then the amygdala giving you your emotional response to that memory. It then feeds into a whole system of chemical um, consequences that react to, to the whole situation, which is often referred to as the HPA axis, which I'm going to touch on um, shortly. But in relation to at its basic level, one of the things, there's two responses is we have the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. So if our limbic system feels that we're under threat or we're uncomfortable, 
our sympathetic nervous system kicks in with a whole load of chemicals that does things like stop saliva being produced in our mouth so that our digestive system um, kind of shuts down for a while so that we put all of the energy within our system into fighting, flighting or freeze as we now know as well. So all of our energy goes into protecting ourselves. But if our limbic system perceives that we're in a safe environment, our parasympathetic nervous system comes, kicks in, where it starts saliva in our mouth again, which has a knock-on consequence where we start um, our digestive system and we can start, uh, um, you know, as well as other functions like heart rate, breathing, oxygen levels, and they all reach a thing called homeostasis is when we're at set point and we're just sitting comfortably, not feeling threat, we have that set point. But if you look at this slide, you can often see some of the long-term physical and medical consequences of too much uh, exposure to some of these neurochemicals. So in relation to the HPA axis, I'm not going to get into it in, in much detail, um, but one of the things um, um, that I would like you to see is in relation to how it leads to the release of some uh, hormones um, and other neurochemicals, some of which can be fine, but at high levels can be quite toxic and lead to long-term medical uh, uh, issues and concerns. So, at its primary level, the HP axis looks at early kind of stress, which can lead to a, a dysregulation of the HPA system. Uh, which is adapting to a kind of a stressful environment. And when we talk about stressful environment, that can be that your needs are not being met. And this is where we go back to neglect. Um, and then that can lead to an increased risk of mental health vulnerability in time. So if you go back to this slide here, you can see that one of the, the, the hormones is cortisol. And if we look at cortisol, high levels of cortisol give us quick bursts of energy, which is a positive thing sometimes, particularly if you're hitting the afternoon slump. Um, it can heighten your memory, which is good. It creates homeostasis in the body and creates lower sensitivity to pain. But prolonged levels can lead to impaired cognitive performance. It can suppress thyroid function, which can then lead to further medical issues and um, blood sugar imbalances, such as hyperglycemia decreased bone density and decrease in muscle tissue, higher blood pressure, which can then obviously lead to heart disease, and lower, lowered immunity and inflammatory responses in the body, which is kind of slowed uh, wound healing. And I'm going to just touch on that very briefly uh, in a few minutes. So um, I don't know if people are familiar with this, but this is one of Bruce Perry's slides uh, from America, where he has try to encapsulate a lot of the uh, effects that happen to the brain in relation to neglect. Um, but I'm just conscious of the time and I am getting quite hungry. Um, but in relation to um, the neurobiology and attachment, secure attachment uh, in neurobiological formulation leads to healthy, consistent and complete development of the following areas, which are known as the orbital frontal cortex, the ventral medial prefrontal cortex and connections into subcortical regions of the brain. And really, in essence, what I'm trying to, to, to say here is in, some, in summary, these, main area, these three areas are mainly responsible for emotion and decision making. And if any of you have clients that are in, let's say, residential care programs or foster placements that are really, really struggling and beginning to break down and you just, I don't know, sit and observe and you just don't say anything and you just watch and observe for a while, the two primary difficulties that you're working with is that the person can't regulate themselves and manage their emotions. And that consequently leads to decisions that they often think are the right decisions for them, but are often misguided and then lead to a whole load of other problems. And you're kind of like, oh, now you're going to get in trouble with the guards because you broke the window or whatever you did, or you smashed the car into a post or whatever it is in relation to the whole kind of piece. 
And these things just don't come out of nowhere. They are an evolving piece over time. And their primary piece can often be related to inter and transgenerational uh, neglect. So that's just a diagram uh, highlighting the three areas that I spoke about. Um, but one primary piece that I did want to bring up, and it is something that can be quite a controversial and quite a contentious issue, particularly when working with kids in care, because of our um, history in relation to children in care um, and some of the you know, uh, uh, institutional abuse that we've had uh, to, to, to deal with and that has become exposed. But oxytocin is often referred to as the love hormone and it is quite a powerful hormone. Um, the reason why, and, and, and it's gaining a lot of respect because there are a lot of books now just talking about the oxytocin effect. There's a lot of research in relation to this whole area. And studies have shown that lower levels of oxytocin in individuals um, who've been exposed to childhood maltreatment. And if you look at what oxytocin is important for, it's important for social bonding, which goes back to your potential to link in at different levels with other human beings. It's involved in stress regulation and alleviating mental health difficulties. And this is quite important because if you work with clients with significant mental health difficulties, the ones that achieve positive outcomes are the ones who have supportive families or supportive partners. And why is that? Because they're being exposed to oxytocin as well as interventions by trained professionals and possibly medication as well. But the best outcomes come from people who have supportive partners or supportive families. So it is a very, very powerful thing. But sometimes children's experience in care is they don't often get to experience a lot of release of oxytocin because of the fact that it's maybe a bit inappropriate to hug them or care for them in particular ways. And it's something that we do need to maybe just think about and talk about and challenge in some kind of ways. Because if somebody is deeply distressed around being emotionally dysregulated and have made awful decisions, and they're now sitting with 10 people in a room telling them how crap they were and got into all kinds of problems, they really need a hug or they need somebody beside them to support them rather than being judged and shamed. Um, I'm sure people are familiar, are, how many people are familiar with the still face experiment? Yeah, good for you. Those of you that are not, um, you can watch this repeatedly if you want um, online. If you just go into YouTube and put in still face experiment, uh, it'll come up. And, or if it doesn't, just put in Ed Tronic or Edward Tronic um, and still face and, and you will find this. Babies this young are extremely responsive to the emotions and the reactivity and the social interaction that they get from the world around them. This is something that we started studying oh, 30, 40 years ago when people didn't think that infants could engage in social interaction. In the still face experiment, what the mother did was she sits down and she's playing with her baby who's about a year of age. I need my girl. Oh. And she gives a greeting to the baby, the baby gives a greeting back to her. Yeah. This baby starts pointing at different places in the world and the mother's trying to engage her and play with her. They're working to coordinate their emotions and their intentions, what they want to do in the world. And that's really what the baby is used to. And then we ask the mother to not respond to the baby. The baby very quickly picks up on this. And then she uses all of her abilities to try and get the mother back. She smiles at the mother. She points because she's used to the mother looking where she points. Yeah. The baby puts both hands up in front of her and says, what's happening here? She makes that screechy sound at the mother, like, come on, why aren't we doing this? 
even in this two minutes when they don't get the normal reaction. They react with negative emotions, they turn away, they feel the stress of it. They actually may lose control of their posture because of the stress that they're experiencing. It's a little like the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good is that normal stuff that goes on, that we all do with our kids. The bad is when something bad happens, but the infant can overcome it. After all, when you stop the still face, the mother and the baby start to play again. The ugly is when you don't give the child any chance to get back to the good there's no reparation, and they're stuck in that really ugly situation. What happens when the mum becomes non-responsive and reactive to the infant, and the infant's limbic system becomes quite uh, uh, um, challenged and, and, and stressed, and the kid does all kinds of things to get the attention from the mum, and eventually just starts to become really, really sad and crying, and almost coils in shame, and slightly away from, from mum. And that's just to show you the power of attachment, the power of the limbic system, and how that whole reciprocal communication piece is vitally important. But one thing I do want to say in relation to that is, a lot of kids who have been neglected often have features of autism. And we often look at, you know, oh, they definitely have autism. They're referred for assessments in relation to autism when it purely is the severe consequences of neglect. And I'm not saying that everyone with autism is misdiagnosed or whatever. I'm just saying it's something that we have to be massively mindful of because there is a lot, a lot of overlap. And if people are familiar and if you want a particular tool that's administered by, and it should be administered by a multidisciplinary team, it's called the Coventry Grid, obviously developed in Coventry in the UK. And what that looks at is characteristics and behaviours and presentation and guides a team to look at, well, are these indicative of autism or ASD or is it indicative of an attachment difficulty and neglect. Um, I've just thrown this up um, in relation because it's something that does the rounds quite a lot. Um, I know I think it was Bruce Perry was responsible for it originally, but um, just in relation to it, uh, th there are a lot of issues around this slide and its authenticity, but also, you know, it, it is supposed to evoke quite a reaction in people because the brain sizes are very different, so we don't know really, uh, um, you know, so it's just to be careful when, when you're looking at it. I'm going to just very quickly um, go through, because you have them in, in the slides, um, just uh, some recent research, uh, well, 2010 from Harvard University, where it did focus on neglect. And what they found was that uh, neglect is the most prevalent form and I think people touched on a figure of 25%, but I think that is an underestimation. And, and, and it's because neglect is one of the, it is the primary uh, concern. Um, we often kind of, it gets mislabeled under other kind of forms of abuse or maltreatment. Neglect can be a greater threat to development um, than abuse, because if we look at somebody's creative, creativity skills, they're lower than those who had no maltreatment, verbal abuse and physical abuse. And then if you look at co confidence and assertiveness, they are lower again. I think one of the reasonable arguments in relation to confidence and assertiveness and creativity is that if you're neglected from quite a young age, you're not given those life experiences that lay down the neural pathways that integrate your limbic system with your neocortex that then allow you have all of these skills. Um, and then the following slides are in, in the same kind of piece where they looked at standard foster care versus therapeutic foster care, where they actually taught foster carers how to maybe regress and go back over some of the basic skills like nurturance and support and providing security in children in order to help those neural pathways evolve and tap into neuroplasticity. And they achieved quite similar uh, outcomes as, as the, the typical range. 
is that slide, can everybody see the slide? So you've got the typical range here. And as you can see with the therapeutic foster care intervention program versus standard kind of foster care, uh, it, it is quite uh, remarkable. So I'm just conscious with the time, and I'm just gonna to go to the last few slides. So the neurobiological consequences of chronic neglect are functional changes. It also leads to structural changes and chemical changes, which then go on and lead to neurodevelopmental delays, um, HPA axis dysfunction, which can then lead to medical uh, and significant medical issues in time, metabolic syndromes, cardiovascular disease, immune system dysfunction, major depressive episodes, post-traumatic stress disorder, because they experience other forms of abuse, probably once or twice, or unfortunately, in, in lots of cases, many, many uh, experiences, compromised reproductive health and transgenerational effects. So they're just uh, kind of summary pieces. I just want to point you to, are people familiar with the ACE study? adverse childhood experiences. And if you ever want to know what are the long-term consequences of maltreatment and trauma and neglect, um, do look at that because it is quite uh, startling. And I've just thrown this in here as a book because I was fortunate enough to attend a presentation, God, about five years ago or six years ago now, uh, by Gordon Turnwell. He's Dr. Gordon Turnwell there. He's now Professor Gordon Turnwell, who's a neuropsychiatrist in the UK. And one of the interesting pieces uh, from his research, and he's researched veterans, war veterans over many, many years, um, who have experienced trauma uh, during the course of their duties. And one of the things that he did find is that the brain has the capacity to um, repair is the wrong word, but to provide support to itself to get over some of the challenges that it experiences as a result of trauma or neglect, because our brain can release tiny, tiny dendrite cells from the cerebellum, which is your old brain at the back of your head, that find their way up to the amygdala and hippocampal areas and actually start healing the process there. This is really exciting because it shows that intervention can be effective and we can actually start doing stuff um, that can be meaningful. But the other piece that he did tap into inadvertently is, he did find from an outcome point of view that it was the veterans who still had a supportive partner or a supportive family that achieved the better outcomes overall, which then tapped into this whole neuro uh, transmission neurochemical effect again. And that's really, really important. So his book is actually quite a, a, an okay read. Um, so I would strongly recommend that. And that's why I was here in the last slide, is I don't think we can achieve much ploughing away at a micro level or individually in dealing with neglect. I think it's going to take many agencies coming together in a very informed, and I'm getting excited by that because there is a lot of congruence in all of the presentations today. So we are beginning to see patterns here and identify certain things, but we have to look at schools we have to look at health. We have to look at um, how we respond in many different ways to neglect because one single person, practitioner, or one single agency certainly isn't going to cut the mustard and it would be unfair to expect that. It's going to take multi-agency and multidisciplinary work in order to meet the many, many consequences that are associated with intergenerational neglect. Thank you.